It's time to get started here. Uh, my name is Jeremy Green, and I'm talking about going serverless. Um, so, what do we mean about what does serverless mean? That's kind of a weird term. Um, the idea is that we want to deploy web applications without servers. Um, so, I'm going to go out on a limb here and do a little bit of mind reading. I bet some of you are thinking a very particular thing right now. You're thinking, Serverless, really? Come on. If you're going to serve something, you need servers, right? So if it'll make you feel better, we can think of it like this. We'll call it serverless with, with big old air quotes. So the, the goal here is that, yeah, there are servers involved, but we don't want to think about them. We want to think about our code as code and not worry about the particulars of the infrastructure that it's being deployed to. Um, if you've deployed to something like Heroku, you already kind of know how this works. You, you know, on Heroku, you're not really thinking about instances. You might be thinking about your dyno size, uh, that kind of thing, but you're not thinking about the physical infrastructure that it's running on. You're just coding your stuff and pushing it up and letting uh, Heroku worry about what machines does it go on? What instances does it go on? That kind of stuff. So that's where we want to get to. Um, and in particular, in this talk, when we talk about serverless, we'll be talking about the serverless framework. Um, the serverless framework is a framework for building web, mobile, and Internet of Things applications exclusively on AWS Lambda, API Gateway, and their other related services. So, a little bit more mind reading here. I bet a few of you noticed that word exclusively on the last slide, and you're probably thinking this. Vendor lock-in. The, so the, the cons of vendor lock-in are pretty obvious, and I'm not re really going to get into them. So, you know, why would you sign up for this kind of vendor lock-in? The most compelling reason is ops. Amazon is better at ops than you will ever be. If you disagree with me on that, please talk to me, and we can put together a nice, fat consulting proposal to help Amazon be better at apps, but that's unlikely. <laughs> so this is especially true if you're an application developer and not an operations engineer. Another one is scale. They have data centers all over the world. By deploying into their infrastructure, you can take advantage of their scale with very little work. And another compelling reason is money, especially when you compare the salary of operations engineers. Deploying into uh, Amazon's infrastructure can be very cost effective. So just a little bit about me. My name is Jeremy Green. I'm a consultant, an author, and I run a couple of SaaS businesses. Uh, you can find me on the tweets at Jag the Drummer. Uh, there's my email. Send me an email if you'd like. Um, the Independent Consulting Manual is a book that I re recently co-authored. Uh, Remark.io is one of my SASs, and I'm also into drumming, photography, and brewing. So if you like any of those things, we can talk about that. Uh, I want to give a shout out to my client, ClickFunnels. They've supported me in this talk. Uh, working with them is where I got into all this serverless stuff. They helped me get to the conference. Um, they've been very supportive. I really appreciate them. Uh, so I don't want to get too deep into the weeds of what they do, but I've prepared this very technical diagram of their uh, infrastructure. So. All right, so enough silliness. Um, first, let's talk about the pieces that we're going to be dealing with. We're, we're kind of going to be using some building blocks that we're going to build up into bigger applications. So the first piece is AWS Lambda. This is basically function execution on demand. I think of it like Heroku for single functions. You give them one little function, tell them how you want it to be run, and then you can call that function either via their API or they have this service called API Gateway, which allows, this is kind of like routing as a service. So this allows you to set up endpoints, and then when somebody hits that endpoint, you can route that request to be handled by Lambda. Uh, you might use DynamoDB to store some data, or you might use R RDS or any of their other services that they offer. And then cloud formation is uh, kind of infrastructure as code. This is a way that you can describe uh, assets that you need in your infrastructure, like a Dynamo table or an RDS instance. 
you can keep that description in your source code repository, and then you can push it to Amazon and ask them to deploy this stuff for you. So this makes it real easy to have, uh, you know, like a staging environment that you can duplicate into production, uh, and you know that you're using the same stuff across all of your stacks. When you put all this together, you're gonna end up with something that looks kinda like this. You're using multiple Amazon services to route uh, requests around, and they give you a lot of tools where you can do this. You can get into their UI, see a list of all your Lambda functions. Uh, you can browse their repository of demo code that shows various applications, various things that you might do. Uh, when you go to create a Lambda function, you can set a bunch of config variables, like how much memory should it have, what's the timeout. Um, you can hook it up to an API endpoint. You can add an event source from some other place. But if you do all this for very long, you're gonna start thinking, seriously, am I coding in the browser? Is, is this what we've come down to? Um, and then if you do that long enough, you're gonna go through a cycle, something like this. You're gonna feel a little bit unamused about it, and then you're gonna start to get worried about the number of things that can possibly go wrong when somebody's just making changes in a browser and not committing anything to source code. And then if you keep down that path, you're gonna get very angry. So don't do this. Uh, this is where the serverless framework comes in. The serverless framework uh, allows you to manage Lambda API Gateway and other cloud formation services via code instead of via GUI. Uh, you can find their docs at docs.serverless.com. It's all pretty good. I should go ahead and say that this is a very young project and is moving very quickly. Um, so everything that I'm gonna talk about and show you in details could change by this afternoon. Uh, probably not, but just be warned, it's very young. So when you get started with serverless, the first step is you wanna create a new AWS account. You don't wanna use the one that you already have up and running for all of your production stuff. And the main reason for this is that the serverless documentation at this point advocates that for getting started, you should create basically an admin super user that can do anything and everything in your infrastructure. And so that's kind of a security risk, you don't want that profile to you know, get into the wrong hands where somebody could start shutting down your production instances or deleting a S3 bucket or something like that. So really, seriously, just start with a new account and then as, as you figured out what you actually want to deploy into production, take time to understand the permission model and do it correctly. So to get started with serverless, it's an NPM module. Uh, my apologies to Searles and uh, Tinderlove for having to talk about Node, but you know, I, I'm fully on board with making Ruby great again. So we'll look at how we can do Ruby in a little while. Um, so once you've installed it, you can do serverless project create. The CLI gives you a nice shorter version of serverless. You don't have to type out the whole thing. You can just say SLS if you want to. Um, and then the first thing you're gonna see is some sweet ASCII art. So that's how you know it's good, right? Um, so then it's gonna start stepping you through the process of creating a new project. It's gonna ask you to enter a name, uh, it's gonna ask you for a stage, and a stage in the serverless terminology is a lot like an environment. Like if you're used to development and staging and production environments, it's almost exactly the same thing, it's just called a stage. Uh, it's gonna ask you what profile you wanna use, if you wanna create a new one or use one that's already there, and then it's gonna ask you what region you're gonna wanna deploy your stuff to. After it does a little bit of stuff, it's gonna finally tell you, okay, your project's ready and some things have been deployed to CloudFormation. If you go into the directory that's been created for this new project, um, you're gonna see a tree that looks about like this. Um, all of this stuff that you're seeing is, in the Rails world, is gonna be stuff like config.ru, uh, you know, config slash application.rb, a bunch of just you know, bootstrap boilerplate that needs to be there to get the thing to run, but that you probably don't really care about until you need to make it do something that it doesn't do out of the box. So we're not even gonna really mess with looking at any of that stuff. So let's build something. Um, but if we're gonna build something, the question is, what do we build? Um, so let's build something that actually does something, not just a stupid hello world application. So how about we do this? <laughs> I mean, it, there's an NPM module for it, right? So that means it, it must be useful enough to be a service. So first thing we're gonna do is serverless function create, give it the name that we want, left pad. 
Uh, it's going to ask you to select a runtime. In this case, we're going to go ahead and use Node 4.3. And then it's going to ask if you want to create an API endpoint or an event or just the function on its own. Uh, in this case, we're going to actually create the endpoint so that it's easy to uh, get deployed. If we look in the directory that's created for us, we have three files. Event.json is a basically where you set up sample data that your function is going to use. Handler.js is the function itself that you're going to write. And sfunction.json is some configuration for the Lambda, for the endpoint, for any other resources that you need. So at this point, it's already ready. We can ship it. And this is part of the workflow that you're going to use with serverless. You can't exactly run Lambda and API Gateway on your local development box. And so you're going to be constantly shipping stuff to Amazon in the dev stage, testing it out there. And then when you're ready, you can promote it into your like staging stage or production stage or whatever. So to, to deploy, you can use serverless dash deploy. Uh, dash is short for dashboard. It's going to give you something like this, more sweet ASCII art, and then a list of all the things that you can deploy. Here I've selected that I want to deploy the function and the endpoint, and then hit the deploy, and it goes and starts doing stuff. And it tells you that it's deployed the function into the dev stage, and then it's deployed the endpoint into the dev stage. And then at the very bottom there, you'll see it gives you a URL that you can hit where you can see your function running through the API endpoint. So if you go hit that, you're going to see something that looks like this. It's a, it returns a JSON blob that has a message, and the message is go serverless. Your Lambda function executed successfully. So let's look at what does the code look like that, that generated this. Um, this is the default handler that serverless generates for you. Very, very simple. Uh, it exports a handler function. The function has three arguments, an event, a context, and a callback. And then for the default one, it's just calling the callback with the payload that we want to deliver. So the event. The event is just a, a JSON object full of data. This is something that you as the developer or whoever is calling this function is going to put together. These are the inputs that go into the function that you want to have worked on to create your outputs. Uh, the context is an object that's provided by the Lambda infrastructure. This gives you some details about who's calling. One of the most important things is get remaining time in milliseconds. So this allows you to do some things that are kind of long running as long as you can pause them. So you could you know, be iterating through a bunch of records and then be checking this to see how much longer you have until your Lambda is forcibly killed. Uh, and then you could you know, write to the database, here's the last one that we did on this run, uh, and then queue another event. Uh, you can also get some stuff about the identity if you're using some of the AWS uh, authorization methods. Um, and then if it's being called from a, a mobile device, you can get some client context about what's the device, what's the operating system it's running, that kind of stuff. And so then finally, you have the callback function. This is also handed in from the Lambda infrastructure. Uh, the signature of it is that you call the callback, passing in an error, and then the data. Uh, this is fairly standard node callback structure. Uh, if you need to only return an error, you can just return the error. But if you need to return actual data, you should return null for the error, and then return your data. So now let's get this, this function actually doing something. So if we go into the left pad directory, we can do npm init. And what's happening here is we're creating a local node modules directory and package.json so that we can have additional libraries that we want to ship with our function. Everything that's in your function directory is going to be shipped to Amazon when you do serverless-deploy. And then we can install left pad and save it so that it gets added to our package.json. So then we can start updating the handler. So the first thing we want to do is require the left pad library. Uh, this is happening outside of the handler instead of inside the handler, because everything outside the handler is run once when, Lam when Amazon first launches and tries to run your Lambda for the first time. So anything that's a long run, like a, 
is going to take some time and is not part of the actual processing of your inputs to generate your outputs, you want to do that outside. This is set up stuff. So then the next thing we can do is uh, declare a couple of variables where we're going to pull uh, data out of the event that is passed in. Uh, and then we're going to create a padded string by calling the left pad function that we get from that NPM module. And then we're going to construct a payload that is, let's just return the padded string as a JSON object. And then finally, we're, we're going to call the callback with null as the first argument because we're, we didn't run into an error, and then the payload as the second. Um, we also need to make some adjustments to S function. Uh, this is all of, all of what you're seeing right now is automatically generated by uh, serverless. This is where you can tell Lambda how much memory you need for your function to run. Uh, you can also set what the timeout is, that kind of stuff. Um, and then the handler line there, you're giving it the name of the handler that should be invoked. And that is constructed by the name of the file that it lives in and then the name of the, the function that's being exported. So in this case, and by default, it's going to be handler.handler .handler because it generates a file called handler.js, and then inside of that, it's exporting handler as a function. Um, this stuff is also auto-generated when you go to create your, your function. I told it that I wanted it to create an endpoint, so it generated, it says there's a path called left pad, and so that means that once you hit the URL that uh, API gate, gateway generates for you, you go to that slash left pad, that's how you're going to invoke this function via the gateway. Uh, you're going to be doing it via git. You can use all of the standard uh, HTTP methods here. It could be git, put, post, delete, even options. Um, and then, then there's a request template. And by default, the request template is blank. And this is basically how you tell API gateway how to generate the event that you want based on the HTTP request that comes in. because your Lambda function doesn't know anything about HTTP. It's not, it's not a native HTTP function. It just gets an event object. It doesn't care how that event object is created or what. So you need to tell API Gateway how to deconstruct an HTTP request and create an event that can be used by your function. So in order to do that, you can add a couple of lines that look like this. So what we're saying is that we want to create an event with two properties, one's called string and one's called padding, and the string event should come from the input params of the HTTP request, and it should be the param called string, and then the same thing for the padding. So once you've made all of those changes, you can dash deploy again, and again, it's gonna give you a, a URL where you can hit it, and so then if you call that URL with a, U, with a couple of uh, query params that look like this, string and padding, it's going to return a padded string, you know, padded out to the 10 spaces that we want it to be. So how do we test something like this? Um, like I mentioned, the, the function is just a function. So it's really pretty easy to test. You test it just like you would any other vanilla function. You don't need to worry about the Lambda stuff, you can, or the API gateway stuff, you can just test the function itself. Uh, so we can install Mocha to drive the tests, and then we could install something like Chai to give us some nice uh, assertions. And then we make a left pad slash handler test, uh, and we require Chai, uh, require the handler file that, we're, that is under test in this function. Um, and so then we can just create, this is basically a mock event that we're gonna pass into the, uh, to the function in order to test it. Uh, the context, we're not using any of the context that Lambda supplies to us in this case, so we can just make it an empty object. And then for the callback, this is where we can do assertions on the return value that we get out of Lambda. So the, we just make a function that has the same signature as the callback that Lambda provides for us. Uh, and then once that's called, we, at that point, we can say that we expect the error to be null because we didn't expect to get anything. And then we can say that we, act, that we expect the response dot padded string to equal the value that we expect to be returned based on what's in the test event. 
So then once you've got that handler in place, or that test file in place, you can just call mocha handler test, and it's going to run it, show you that it's returned the right thing, and that it's been successful. So what about Ruby? I mean, that's kind of a bummer that Ruby's not supported right out of the box. But we can do some things to get it to run. Um, what, what I'm going to show you here is all at the proof of concept stage. It's not production ready. If you want to do Ruby in Lambda, you, you're going to want to harden it a little bit and make it a little more resilient to errors, uh, crashes, that kind of thing. Um, so what I did here was serverless function create uh, and then called it mruby hello world. I added two additional files into that directory. One is a Ruby script that's going to run some Ruby code. And the other one is the mruby executable itself. Uh, I used mruby on this because uh, I had found a proof of concept that Nick Caranto put together previously that was using mruby, so I knew it was compiled and would run on Lambda. Uh, AWS does publish what uh, operating system and a AMI image that they are running the lambdas on. So if you do need to compile stuff, you can fire up an EC2 instance, compile new stuff there, and then add that binary into your uh, package. You're probably going to want to make sure that you statically link everything because they don't provide a whole lot of stuff in the, the default image. So since Lambda doesn't support Ruby right out of the gate, we kind of have to get it to work in a backhanded way. We have to write a, a node-based handler that then shells out to Ruby to let it do what it needs to do. So to make that work, we're going to use the spawn library. I'm sorry, we're going to use the child process library and, in specific, their spawn function. Um, to create our process, we're going to call spawn, telling it that we want to use the mruby executable that's in the project directory, and that we want it to run handler, and that, we, that it should pass in a JSON stringified version of the event. This lets the Ruby script know what the inputs are that we got. Uh, we're going to hook up a couple of handlers for any time that the Ruby script puts anything on stand, standard out or standard error. We want to capture that and push it into an array so that we have all of our outputs. Uh, and then we want to say that when that child process closes, when the Ruby script is done running, uh, at that point we want to call the callback function that we get from Lambda so that we can tell Lambda that everything is executed and that we're done. So for the purposes of this demo, this is a very simple handler.rb. All we're doing is a couple of puts to output some data. And so then if you call this one, uh, mruby hello world, you'll see that we get back um, an object that has the message. One message that came from our node handler itself, and then the Ruby output, which is an array of all of the data that the Ruby script put out to the command line. Like I said before, this is not production ready. Uh, there are numerous ways that you can improve on this to make it work, but it does work and you know, is a proof of concept that you can use Ruby with the serverless framework in Lambda. So how fast is all of this stuff? Um, it's really reasonably fast. Um, so this is a, a chart of the API gateway timing. Um, that baseline down there at the very bottom is about 30 to 40 milliseconds, and that's the entire time that a request coming into the API gateway is inside the Amazon, inside the Amazon infrastructure. That's from the time it hits the API gateway, is routed to Lambda, Lambda executes, Lambda returns, and then the response is returned out of the API gateway. But there's some pretty big spikes there. They're going up to like 650 or 700 milliseconds. So what's going on there? That's what uh, Lambda refers to as the cold start penalty. And so basically any time that a request comes in and AWS doesn't already have a Lambda function or a Lambda spun up and ready to accept a request, it's going to go through the cold start process. That's basically them provisioning a container, loading your code onto the disk in that container, 
and then calling your handler, and getting it started. So that takes a little bit of extra time. And the, the cold start scenario can happen either when you've just pushed new code and are calling it for the first time, or if you get, start to get a lot of concurrent requests. So like you'll have one uh, request come in, cold start happens, and it's handling a, a request, and then if another request comes in before that one has completed, you're gonna get another cold start, and then you're gonna have two lambdas running. Uh, by default, you can run up to 100 lambdas concurrently, and if you need more than that, you can uh, apply to AWS to have your cap raised. Um, so I set up RunScope to just time these two things from outside of the, the Lambda environment, or the AWS environment, and I was consistently getting about this average response time of 70 to 75 milliseconds, uh, with the MRuby one being consistently about five to six milliseconds more time. Uh, and so this is you know, going over the wire, getting into the AWS infrastructure, and getting back. If we look at the timing for the lambdas themselves, uh, they look about like this. The orange one is the MRuby, and the blue one is just a vanilla node-based hello world. Uh, we can see on this that the MRuby one is consistently about four milliseconds slower. Uh, the baseline on the node one is about half a millisecond of runtime. This is only in Lambda itself. This is not including the API gateway or any network effects. This is just the sheer execution time of the, the handler function itself. Um, and oh, I should mention that MRuby is, is a very scaled down, small version of Ruby. It is not everything. So if you need, you know, everything that Ruby provides for you, you're gonna have a larger executable. That's gonna take longer to load onto the container, so your startup, your uh, cold start time is gonna be worse, um, and your execution time is probably gonna be a little bit worse too, just because it's gonna take longer to, to load. Um, in the Lambda timings, you can see cold starts there as well. Even though this doesn't include the time that your code is being loaded onto the disk, it's the first time that your code is being run, so it's the first time it's being loaded into memory. And so that takes a little extra time just in the Lambda execution itself. Uh, all right, so to wrap this up, um, AWS provides building blocks. They give you Lambda, API Gateway, all of their database services. Serverless provides some structure and process on top of everything so that you're not coding in the browser or trying to manipulate their APIs directly yourself, and then you provide the magic. So thanks. <laughs>